I was asked if I could be available to jam with people about things, and such is what I'd love to do. And so I said, sure, I'll do that. And there's a topic that's sort of close to my heart, and it is test design. And I'm a big fan of people who are practitioners in software testing, developing as many skills as they can in the area of test design. So I sort of advocate that, promote that. I'm sure that all of you in the world, how many identify yourselves as testers or related to testing? So pretty close to 87.932%, like roughly like that. Uh, people identify themselves as testers. I hope that they learn about test design. And I hope they learn that a test design can be a very deliberate thing. And this is not just an arbitrary, random test thing. It's a deliberate thing. We can choose many different approaches to design things. And there's a whole bunch available to us now. There's a whole bunch that haven't been invented. Our field is a new field. The book, um, The Art of Software Testing by Glenford Mayer was first published in 1979. And that was actually the first book about testing that actually talked about testing as a discipline and talked about test design and talked about test design almost like it was, it was like a skill, a skill set. Uh, and that was 1979. Now, civil engineers and architects uh, actively reference a book today called Vitruvius. This book, Vitruvius, was written about 26 BCE in ancient Rome. It is brilliant. I have the modern English translation of it. It is absolutely fantastic. It talks about things that you would be shocked to see how cool it is. It talks about what is quality. It talks about team building. It talks about organizing things. And it also conflates the subject matter of architecture and civil engineering into one discipline. So today, there are very clearly two disciplines. But at the time, in 26 BCE, there were one discipline. And they talk about things like how to make aqueducts, how to make bridges, how to make walls, how to make sewer systems, how to make all these cool things. And today, architects and civil engineers really, really do actively reference Vitruvius. It is not just a, uh, you know, an homage to Vitruvius. They will actually say, this principle of Vitruvius we're violating in this way. Now, this is active referencing. This is not just you know, shaping paw to the guy who wrote the first book on the subject. Uh, I love the fact that they have 2,000 years of historic evidence-based practice behind them. We have maybe 30 at best, and we're not keeping good track of the evidence, by the way. As much as I like to think we have some experience as a field, we're not really doing a really good job of, of sharing it. That's probably because the first 30 years of the testing world was a bunch of vendors fighting each other for proprietary tools, sales, and stuff like that. Didn't advance practice of sharing very much. But people have still looked at testing and come up with all sorts of ways to design tests. And so I encourage people to learn as many as they can, learn as many as they can, and to teach and share with hopefully examples with other people, different ways to design tests. So I wanted to just do a little show and tell of uh, at least one test design technique and a little story around it and jam about it, hopefully having a dialogue about it as we go. Uh, the problem is it's a true problem and I'm allowed to name the customer and I'm allowed to share a lot of details about the, customer, the problem because it has been published. And it was it took place at CNA Insurance in Chicago. Anyone from Chicago or been to Chicago or heard of Chicago? <laughs> Chicago's on this fantasy land somewhere. Uh, what is it, how would I describe it? West of New York and south of the Great Lakes. And, but it's just shut south of the Great Lakes. Just, just. And in Chicago, there's a place called The Loop. In the middle of town, if you're familiar with it, The Loop is there. The Loop, the Loop has four giant buildings on it. One of them is a big red building. That big red building is CNA Insurance. So that's the company that this story took place. I'm not saying this is self-promotion, but what I was doing was training. I was doing training on site in a workshop format. Literally a group like this size, project team would work with me for a day or so on real problems, and then we'd go from group to group and come back every few weeks to do it. And by the way, not to, this is not self-promotion, but that's a good way to teach test design techniques. Right? Have an expert come in and coach them for a while and let them make mistakes for a few weeks, and then you go back and you, you, you do the feedback. It's a fantastic approach. But I was there, and it was a beautiful Thursday afternoon. It was a summer, hot, Chicago hot day. And I was in the room teaching some test design techniques, whatever we were dealing with, when suddenly the door flung open, and in came the QA manager saying, Rob, we have a testing emergency. We have a testing emergency. We have a crisis. Please help us. 
So I was there in my more teaching capacity, but I said, well, just a minute, let me take off my teaching hat, let me put on my crisis hat. I said, sure, I'll help you, a class dismissed, talk to you tomorrow type of thing. And I went to the CNA insurance war room. The war room. Do you have war rooms in your company? Some companies do. The war room is where project managers like to keep track of key metrics and things. So I'm in the war room at CNA Insurance, and the problem was explained to me. There was a deployment, a pilot deployment of a new multi-tier business solution using WebSphere technology sitting on AIX boxes, if you're familiar with those things. And this technology was replacing an old mainframe technology, which had been installed and used for years and years and years. So the basically mainframe was being replaced by the multi-tier web architecture. They had been through all of their SDLC serious testing, blah, blah, blah. Everything looked good from their perspective, but out of prudence, before deploying it to the whole world, they picked a subset, about 400 users, and they deployed it to those 400 users and said, we'll use this for a few days, whatever they called it, a pilot release. And these 400 users were stumbling all over everything. Nothing was working. Nothing was working. It was terrible. It was bugs everywhere. All of this whole system had passed all of its system testing very thoroughly. Something went wrong. <laughs> How could it have passed so well all of our system testing, but now be failing all over the place, thus the crisis? So I look with them at the thing, and I, and I start talking about the types of problems. And it became evident within a few minutes that uh, the type of problem they were having was a cross-feature interference, cross-functional interference problems, which is not an uncommon problem when you have shared objects, or shared methods, or shared, shared classes, or shared anything. And they were used to not having shared anything, so they were used to having orthogonal separate things with, with everything with a private data set before, and the new things now shared object models, very different architecture, and there was a type of risk that they had not, they had hitherto not been exposed to as an organization, as a testing team, cross-feature interference risk. You probably all think that's an obvious thing for them, it, was not, it wasn't obvious, it was not obvious. They had very thoroughly tested each screen of their system independently before they got there. Now their system had, uh, there was three pull down menus to get to a screen. So menu A had uh, five options, menu B had six options, menu C had two options. And so the first thing is, well, how many, in each, each set, each combination went to an individual unique page. So there would have been 60 unique pages. Does everyone get the map there? So that's 60 unique pages to go through. And they had thoroughly, very thoroughly tested these pages. I mean, they took out, you know, their, their shining, brass shining equipment, and they made sure these pages all were beautiful and working well. And in and, of, and by themselves, they were pretty good pages. But it looked like when they did certain combinations of pages, things were failing all over the place, and so there were serious problems. Um, so I basically sort of talked to them a bit. This ah, now we understand the class of problem. Let's try every way we can order all these pages. Let's try to use a term that you might see in set theory. Let's try all the permutations of these 60 pages. Now you take these 60 pages and say, that sounds like a smart idea. Try the permutations of the pages. So how many permutations do you have of a set of 60 objects? And to calculate that, it's not too complicated. I know you have to maybe brush off, dust off your discrete math book and your common torch book, but it's there. You, you learned it in school, it's 60 factorial, which is equal to 60 times 59 factorial, which is equal to 60 times 59 times 58 factorial, which is, and you just sort of multiply it all down the chain, and you get 60 times 59 times 58 times dot, 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 three, two, one. And, you know, start talking about this, and well, we might need some automation, <laughs> some automation. Uh, 60 factorial is equal to approximately 8.31 times 10 to the 81. Now, if you're interested in going to a pool testing conference this year, go to CAST. CAST is taking place at the Space Coast. And the Space Coast is right near where they launched those beautiful rockets and satellites into outer space in Cape Canaveral. And I love it because they have a museum there where you actually see all the artifacts of the Hubble project. And you get to see all the physicists' claims about Hubble. And NASA physicists claim that the number of atoms that you can see from the Hubble telescope is between 10 to the 79 and 10 to the 82 atoms. 
the number of atoms in the visible universe, according to Hubble, is between 10 to the 79 and 10 to the 82. And that means that my customer in Chicago wanted to do more test cases than the lower bounds of the number of particles of matter in the visible universe for sure. This really happened. That was true. They wanted to do that. I had to explain them that it was absurd and impossible. They had to choose the subset. Since the 1960s, we have known from the work of Edgar Dijkstra that testing show the presence of bugs, cannot show the absence of bugs. Even the simplest problem has an intractably large number of test cases. In fact, you can even demonstrate it's an infinite set. Although I'm not going to go through the rigor of that right now, just to say it's huge and impossible to test everything. So I worked with my customer to try to convince them that maybe we want to use a subset. So how do we find a reasonable subset on that afternoon in Chicago. And I sort of tried to understand what mattered. What do you care about? What matters? And they sort of cared that people can do their job. OK, so you want people to be able to do their job. Is that what matters? Since it doesn't always matter that way. It's not always the same thing. But for them, that's what it was. So I said, well, who here knows how they do their job. And there was a sort of a, suddenly the bigger bit of a rift here, because they had been modeling all of their testing on what the product did for the users. And I sort of was leaning towards this model, what the users did with the software. This is called a paradigm shift, if you want to study the, <laughs> the concept. Look at it from a very different point of view. And they said, we have a whole training department that just spent the last six months putting together workflow analysis of this whole system. Get them in the room. And the war room summons. They summon the training director responsible for the system. And the training director explains to us the workflow, and how beautiful and well organized it was, and how they have all the training modules for all the things set up. And it was like really neat to see the product from the point of view of workflow. So I took a look with them at the workflow diagram. May I show it to you? It will show you the real workflow diagram from Cine Insurance on that particular day. Somewhere buried in this slide presentation here is that workflow. There it is. Their slide from the current day. They had chosen to use a flow chart. There was a few, few other ancillary pages with this explaining terms and some of the diagrams. But they used a flow chart to describe the workflow. And in fact, I looked at the flow chart. I said, OK, well, I know a test design technique that can help me identify a subset of the pathways through this workflow that have a few properties that might be interesting and might help you build, build confidence. A few properties. Not a lot of properties, a few properties. One of the properties of the subset that I could find for you is that if you test the subset, you'll have tested every step in the workflow at least once. That's an interesting thing. For them, that was important. They understood that very well. And I said, well, there's another aspect of this subset, and that is that every time you get to a junction or a decision point, every time you get to a junction or a decision point, you'll have at least one test that goes this way, and at least one test that goes that way. And I said, and there's a third thing about the subset. I said, if you take this subset and you do all of them, can't just take a subset of my subset. This subset is a test design <laughs> in its entirety that you can construct any path through the system by linearly combining the subsets. Those are the three characteristics. It was a guy in Chicago first described those three characteristics, and it's called McCabe's cyclomatic complexity. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of McCabe's cyclomatic complexity. This is a white box analysis technique that's used a lot by programmers to understand the complexity of their code. It comes from the field of discrete math and what's called graph theory. You take your program, you draw a picture, which is called a graph, and then you find pathways through the graph. And you know, if you know code, you know that any sensible module has probably got an infinite number of pathways, including looping through it. If you include looping through, there's an infinite number. 
If there's not looping, there's a subset of an infinite number, but the basis paths is a subset of all the possible paths that have these characteristics. And it doesn't mean the thing is perfect, it doesn't mean everything works. It's just an interesting subset. An interesting subset. So, I helped them find that subset. I didn't have all my tools with me. I had a flip chart sheet like this. <coughs> this side, this is a digital photo of the damn flip chart sheet. That's the one. And I took the marker, I drew, I drew it up. And I screwed up. You see that R there? That R? Should have been down there, we done pretty. But because my R was too high up, everything was claustrophobic. I wish the R was down there, but the R is up here. Okay, so the R is right there. But it's planar. <coughs> it's planar. Anybody who loves math, which you see, if you can draw a graph and it's planar, there's no two lines overlap. You say, there's something well thought out here. There's, there's some symmetry here. There's something beautiful underneath this. Then I took this and I used an algorithm, which I learned from Lee Copeland's book, A Practitioner's Guide to Test Design. It is actually described in the book. The algorithm is described in the book. I have a subset of it described in my notes here. But his is more rigorously described. <clears throat> so to find basis paths, the first thing you do is you find a path through the workflow. You find a path through the workflow. That's the first thing you do. Then, that gives you the first path. Then to find the second path, you walk through the first pass, but when you come to a decision, you flip it from what it was the first time around, and you keep everything else as close to the original one as you can. Then you go to the second decision, and third, and so on, until you've exhausted all the decisions on the first path. Then you pop the second path after this off the stack, and go through the decisions on that, and you recursively continue that until you've exhausted the draft. And that's what I did by hand in Chicago that afternoon. I did that by hand in Chicago that afternoon. And this is, this is what Dwayne was talking about, practice, OK? Because I don't think many people can do that. And I don't, ever, I don't ever want you to have the skill to do that. That's absurd. To do this by hand is tedious and so prone for error. And you can miss things. You can really easily accidentally miss a branch or something like that. So I prefer that you use tools to do this. And I'll share it with you want a tool that me and my undergraduates at McGill put together to share with people to help them solve such problems. If you ever find yourself in Chicago with such a problem, uh, the tool would be helpful. It doesn't seem to work in other cities. I, I tried it in Ohio. I had hopes in Ohio, and I'm working on Utah. Maybe Utah. But definitely in Illinois, this tool works. And basically what I did was I found out that this system had 45 nodes, that's the circles, these are nodes, that's the basic point in the control flow diagram. It had 65 edges, that's the line between them, giving me a complexity of uh, 22, which is E minus N plus 2, that's McCabe's equation. So there's 22 basis paths in the system, and these are the ones that I found. This is not a unique, sorry, it's not a unique set. Uh, there's more than one possible set. There's more than one possible set of paths that have this characteristic. This is not a unique set. Now my customers in Chicago went through this, and let me double check my, my math here. <laughs> they basically did these 22 tests. These 22 tests took over three weeks to run. These 22 tests involved designing a transaction that can actually go through that path with appropriate data that would go through that path and when they ran it, they found bugs because of that path, and they fixed the bug, and then they kept going until they got through all 22 without having any more bugs. They finished their pilot, and with no additional software engineering work, we were able to deploy production. So that is my test design story. That's called control flow testing. Control flow testing has a bad rap in the world of software testing because it's taught as a white box technique. You don't know how important it is for us to take a look and abstract from the techniques, the utility of the techniques. If you can model something with a control flow diagram, 
Control flow diagrams are not complicated diagrams. They're pictures that have basically got circles and arrows. <laughs> There's three elements of them. You can have process steps. A flows to B, B flows to C. That's one type. You can have decisions. A goes to B or A goes to C. The convention is that the right one will be true. And then there's junctions. B and C comes from A or C comes from B. If you can model, if you can take your testing problem and draw a picture like this, you can use these methods to find a neat set of paths. And it's not perfect, and there's outliers, and there's bugs I'm not going to catch with these paths. But it's a really useful path when you can build confidence because you've tried every step at least once, every decision, every way it can go at least once, and you can construct any path by linearly combining the paths. That gives you a type of confidence. It doesn't give you truth. We don't have verite. We're not in a world of truth, by the way. There's no truth in software testing. There is heuristics. This is a heuristic, but it's a really useful test design technique. So the tool that we cooked up to do it at McGill is called Paths, and it's a teeny little menu Java application, and it runs in a command line. How many people ever use a command line? Oh, thank you. The right people can. <laughs> I've got, so some of my customers, I try to show them this technique. And then they want me to write this application so they can hit a button on the screen and they get all this stuff going on. It's, it's not like that. This is a tool that's to help. It's not got a fancy GUI or anything. It's very, very simple. So what you do is you take your problem, yeah, whatever it is, and you create a control flow diagram. And then you transcribe the control flow diagram into a text file. If I can just open up an example text file here. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Do I have a nice one? There's a nice one. Uh, from an American insurance company that uses a statue in New York in their advertising. I won't mention the name of them. Um, <laughs> they like New York statues, though. <laughs> Big statue. So green. Did you notice that? Is it bronze? Is it bronze or copper? Bronze. I'm maybe dealing with the wrong company. Um, so uh, let me open up the file. Here, note that plus plus, that's good. So in this file, we have a problem space where we have, um, if you look at that, uh, this, is, this is the input file format. It's trivial. They're just text strings that represent the names of the nodes, the circles. So the S is the starting node, that's the first line. E is the ending node, that's the last line. And then everything else here is just the name of an edge. So S goes to PS, PS goes to AG, AG goes to PS. Whatever notation you have, it's just text strings. You take that, and you, you basically then run a batch file. So if I can open up a little batch file here somewhere. Do have an example batch file? Uh, let's see. Looks like this. Uh, okay, so da 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 da. Maybe you can click on that file as well. You better click on it like this, right? And thank you. Like that. So this is what it looks like. So basically, uh, Java minus jar, paths.jar, that's the paths program. Then you put the name of the input file. It's a text file. So labin.txt is the input file. If you want the basis paths, you put minus basis as a command line argument. You redirect the output to a text file for the output. That's the syntax of the tool. And so that's what it looks like. And the output files for these things look something like this. Very trivial format. So you'll have basically, it'll say there's 103 nodes, 157 edges, complexity 56, and it will give you a set of basis paths. So in this case, there's 56 basis paths in this particular example. Uh, it's for small, small systems, uh, it's probably not worth doing this because you could probably do a, a lot of the paths a lot more than just a basis pass. But if you start having systems that have literally thousands of nodes in them, this becomes a very, very nice systematic way to um, design your test. So this is called control flow analysis. As I said, it's got a bad rap because it's been classified by an organization, a 
Are we allowed to say the name of the organization? No, it's, like, it's like in Mordor, you're not allowed to talk about that. The ISTQB has classified this as a white box testing technique. I defy that and say it's a, it's a technique that if you can draw a control flow diagram, it's a useful testing technique. I don't care if it's white box, black box, green box, I don't care. It's, it's a cool test design technique. It's called path analysis. I, I certainly don't use it on every single project, but I use it on projects where I have networks with lots of different ways through it. It could be data flow, control flow, process flow. It could be code in white box testing. This is a fantastic tool for white box test analysis. I am not opposed to that. But when you teach it and you say, this is a white box testing technique, well, people clue out and say, I don't, I don't test code, I test systems. And you don't learn it. And this is a, I think it's a really cool method. And so I hope that you can add it to your list of methods. Uh, if you're interested in the gazillions of little examples I've got, I'd be happy to share with you a Dropbox link with the, the tool and some batch files and a bunch of input and output examples of it. But um, that's what I wanted to show you guys. Control flow analysis, path analysis. And of course now we're going to jam, so you're going to ask me questions like, what context would I use it? In what context wouldn't I use it? How would I teach someone to do it? And all these type of questions. But I leave it to you because I'm not the facilitator. We have a facilitator in the back of the room there. Go ahead. But I do have a question. <laughs> well, you have to facilitate too. <laughs> um, the first question, uh, how is this different or is it, is it different from pairwise testing? Dramatically different. It's not, it's not the same problem. I did not teach what pairwise testing was, so I don't want to start using the vocabulary okay. of pairwise testing. But if people are interested in, in the type of testing, a pairwise testing technique is a combinatorics technique. So you have n objects, and you want to choose subsets of those n objects, combinations of them. Um, the path one is not really the same. It's looking at a network and navigating through it. Okay. So it's not the same type of testing problem. Uh, I could probably model my customer's problem in Chicago, parts of it with pairwise testing techniques. But, but it was obviously to me a path analysis uh, type of problem. So pairwise testing techniques is when you have more possible combinations than you can ever reasonably do. For example, those of you who joined me for the workshop on testing uh, JIT uh, the other day, I showed the Rappomatic. Rappomatic is a chocolate wrapping device. And I showed you this big mind map of all the variables in the Rappomatic. And we had the chocolate type, and the paper type, and the box type. Well, if I have a pairwise combinations test set, I'm going to have every paper type with every box type at least once. Every paper type with every ribbon type at least once. Every paper type with every chocolate type at least once. Plus, over and above that, every chocolate type with every ribbon type at least once. Every any two variables, every combination at least once. That's a pairwise complete set. It's a beautiful set if you have the right combinatorics problem. Uh, pairwise complete sets like that are very good at finding a weird uh, outliers in, in combination testing. They are not necessarily good at building confidence in stakeholders. Most of my stakeholders prefer that I do what's called a Pareto analysis test design as opposed to a pairwise test design. Pareto analysis is the 80-20 rule as quoted by Joseph Duran, uh, paraphrasing the work of the Italian economist Alfredo Pareto that basically says in, in testing parlance that uh, in a transactional system, <laughs> 20% of the transactions happen 80% of the time. So what's the set that's interesting to test? Well, for my stakeholders who want this warm, fuzzy feeling in their tummy, they want me to test that 20%. That's Pareto. So I, I usually complement it. I will use Pareto for some of my combinations testing, and I'll use n-wise techniques, not just pairwise. There's single, pair, triple, quadruple, and couple. It's not just pair. Right? There's a lot more than just pairs. And those are also cool test design techniques. And we can jam for we'll another half hour. I can do a pairwise test design one. And in another half hour, I'll, I'll do a decision take one. And in another half hour, we can keep going forever and forever. I want you to learn as many as you can. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did. I love the pairwise testing techniques. You went above and beyond, but you got the answer. I, I, love, I love pairwise testing techniques. But when I've had problems with pairwise testing techniques is you sort of get this young tester who thinks he's a Mozart, right? But he's getting there. And he doesn't have a daddy to hit him on the wrist enough. And he he's, he's basically learns this thing and starts doing really, really good work. And then all of a sudden, he starts taking every single problem he runs into and turns it into a pairwise combinations testing problem. And say, look, I'm salavi. It's not like that. Line. We have to choose the punishment that fits the crime, the tool that helps us solve the problem.
street test design like a blade and a Swiss Army knife and choose the appropriate blade. Mm -hmm. so, so test design with pairwise combination testing is excellent and awesome, but it doesn't solve all problems for all people, which is why I felt the need to talk about Pareto. Pareto's common ones, pairwise uncommon. In fact, I've seen people find bugs with pairwise testing uh, tools, really good bugs. You'd be proud of the bug, but then you read this and you sort of say, well, the bug sounds like this. Well, the moon is in the seventh house and uh, Jupiter is aligned with Mars and love is steering the planets, you know, and peace is going to guide the stars, and then it crashes. And what are you going to say? So, Who's ever going to do that? No one's ever going to do that because pairwise combination test design techniques are unrealistic, but they're super. <laughs> they find great bugs, but they're unrealistic. So if you ever run into a stakeholder that tries to beat you up because your test cases aren't realistic, the skill you want to develop is bug advocacy. <laughs> Take that unrealistic test with a great bug and turn it into that compelling story that will get people to want to fix it. So any other questions? Uh, I have a question. You are saying, uh, despite your uh, um, not wanting it to be taught this way, but that uh, the um, uh, I'm blanking out the name. Uh, control flow testing yes. was uh, white box testing. It's classified by STQB. So, uh, but you also said that the problem that you used to that you used that to solve was that there were three drop downs and each had a certain number of. of uh, well, that's just to define how many pages there were. There were sixty pages. In right. fact, only forty-seven of them show up in workflows. Ah, okay. So, but, that, but that, that's okay. true. I, I just when I talk about it, I start with uh, the three controls to get to the sixty pages. Right. And think of a bank teller. A bank teller, if you ever watch a bank teller, they'll flip between screens all over the place. And, and it's really amazing. They can go from any screen to any other screen with sort of like pull down menus or hotkeys. And that's the type of thing they have here. So you can actually do, an operator could actually do any path through this system, rational or not. <laughs> there was nothing blocking the flow. It was interesting. But uh, couldn't you model that without access to the code? I mean, couldn't you do it yes. as black box testing? I did. Everything so, I did was black box. So why are they calling it white box? That's, what, that's exactly my, my, my rhetorical point here is exactly that. Okay. That it's not a black box technique. It's not a white box technique. It's just that it's so commonly associated with testing code. But it's not just testing code. You can use any controls. As you, as you rightly brought up, it was black box. What I did was, of course, black box. Yeah. But okay. they classify it as white box, and therefore people don't learn it when they learn the black box techniques. And I'm sort of saying, take this up, think of it another way. Think this, if you can draw that picture, if you can create a control flow diagram, then this type of test design technique is awesome. Thank you. And that's, that's, you're exactly right. We have time for one more question. Okay. Anybody, other questions? Gentleman over here. Uh, how do you define a node? Is it any choice that they make? So I'm process element, usually, or a decision. I've got examples of decisions. I've got examples of process elements. And this is one of the things where I think you've got to practice a bit because taking that flowchart and creating that control flow diagram looks trivial here, but actually involved a lot of dumb questions. Who was asking them that they thought were obvious? Because I had to take like three starting points and create an artificial node for a, for a, a starting point, and then I had to like six ending points and create two end nodes for ending points, and then one node. Up. There's all sorts of things I had to do to make it into a control flow diagram. But generally, it's like a, a process step. And if you have multiple decisions, you have, two, you have two or three choices in what you can do. You can take multiple decisions and break it down. And I've got some examples where I've done that, where I, I make like a mind map of the decisions and I break them down. Or, or you can basically put like one block with, or one circle with six lines coming out of it. it, it it's, a, it's, it's a modeling thing. It does take time to, to get good at it. But it, it does, it's decision point and process step is what it is. And if using data, it's a data flow point. So it doesn't even have any codes. What is the data going to go? What is the data is either moved or transformed? So just what are the steps in that? But I think you might benefit from more of the examples. If you get the Dropbox from me, send me an email, I'll, I'll give you uh, a link to it. And then offline, uh, uh, you know, this talk and all my other talks comes with a lifetime guarantee. And I'm not joking, it's it's true. Any questions you ever have about this stuff, I'm here for you. Send me an email. Uh, and I will hopefully help promote safe, healthy testing practices with people like Dwayne here. Bam.